Good morning, everyone. This is Bill Bauer, and welcome to the second of our series of web-based seminars entitled Best Practices in TV Control. Today's topic is what works best in rural areas and low incident settings. My name is Bill Bauer, and I'm Director of Education and Training at the Charles P. Felton National Tuberculosis Center a component of the Northeastern Regional Training and Medical Consultation Consortium at the New Jersey Medical School. Today's program is sponsored by the consortium. Program norms, centralization, decentralization, geographical distance, funding, and staff levels can present constraints, but some approaches work better than others. This web-based course will explore successful and innovative approaches to working in rural areas and low incidence settings, which are found in all states, even those with higher incidence. TB program experts will share their hands-on experience and practical approaches that can improve patient outcomes and program performance. The objectives of today's session are that by the end, you will be able to identify challenges faced by TB control programs in low incidence and rural areas and describe successful and innovative approaches to these challenges as outlined by speakers from the TB Epidemiological Studies Consortium, or TBESC, of the states of New Hampshire and Michigan, as well as other participants who are counting on to give examples from their own experience. We also would like you to be able to explain how you can adapt and implement these approaches in your own program areas. Now, our faculty today, we have Lisa Pascapella, who is an administrator and epidemiological, ep epidemiologist at the TB Epidemiological Studies Consortium at the Francis J. Curry National TB Center. She is the person, the second from the left in the group photo that shows the staff from that project at the Curry Center. We also have Judy Proctor, who is TB Program Coordinator at the State of New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services and Peter Davidson, TB Program Coordinator at the Michigan Department of Community Health. Now, today's agenda, the conference will consist of three parts. First will be a presentation about the challenges that TB control programs in low incidence areas and rural settings are facing, and a review of lessons learned from the TB Epidemiological Studies Consortium Task Order Number 6. This will outline common themes and effective strategies for programs and staff who are working in these settings. Second, we'll learn about New Hampshire's unique program structure and some local solutions that have relevance to other program areas. And third, we'll have a chance to learn about Michigan's program experience and approaches that could be useful in other low incidence areas. If time permits, I'd like to have one or two questions after each speaker and then at the end, uh, time for general discussion, for your comments, and for any last-minute uh, last questions for all of our panelists. So we start today with an overview of the challenges faced by TB control programs in low incidence areas and rural settings, um, and with highlights of the lessons learned from the Task Order 6. This will outline common themes and effective strategies and we'd like to turn first to Dr. Lisa Pascapella to explore these subjects. Dr. Pascapella is the TB Epi Studies Consortium Administrator and Epidemiologist at the Curry Center in San Francisco. She has a doctorate in molecular genetics and a master's in public health and epidemiology. Her previous jobs have taken her from the Environmental Protection Agency in New Jersey to the Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Hamilton, Montana, and finally to the Golden State, where since 1998, she's been involved in TB work at the California Department of Health Services, the TB Control Branch, and the Center for Infectious Diseases Preparedness, as well as the Francis J. Curry National Tuberculosis Center. Good morning, all. This is Lisa Pascapella. I'm glad that you're all here, and I'm really happy to be talking about a project that um, we are working on here at the Francis J. Curry National TV Center that we're hoping is really going to provide lessons to low incidence areas. And I'll tell you a little bit about it as I move along. 
So the objective for the talk is to first um, provide the background to you for the TB capacity building project. This is the project known as Task Order 6. It's one of many research studies um, that is performed by the CDC-funded Tuberculosis Epidemiologic Studies Consortium. It is a partnership between the Francis J. Curry National Tuberculosis Center and four state TB control programs in the West that are low incidence. These states include Idaho, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, and the goal, it's, it's a five-year project, and we're now in its fourth year. And so we believe at this point in time that we have some lessons that I can talk to you about, although I think we'll learn a lot more by the very end of the project because we're in its evaluation phase now. I'd also like to describe the project methods and the relevance to TB control in other low incidence areas, and finally present challenges and lessons learned. By way of background, many of you are familiar with this graph that shows the trends of tuberculosis uh, during the past few decades in the United States. Uh, but I want to point out to the idea that uh, a few years ago when this project was first started, um, it really looked like TB elimination was within, uh, on our radar screen, that it was actually a, a real possibility. But as you know, the next slide demonstrates that not all states uh, have low incidence. It's about 26 of the 50 states that have less than 3.5 tuberculosis cases per 100,000. And it's in these areas that the CDC felt like it made a lot of sense to focus on um, developing best practice models for uh, identifying how do we move from TB control to elimination. And that is part of the background of the, of the creation of this project. And then also another report that many of you are familiar with is the Institute of Medicine report, Ending Neglect, um, which really outlined uh, sort of the proposals and strategies for the future that needed to occur for us to truly eliminate tuberculosis. And one of the main um, ideas there is that access to an efficiency in using clinical, epidemiological, and programmatic services is necessary, that improved access is required, and that one way to do this would be to look at regional models for eliminating tuberculosis using a combination of federal and multi-state initiatives. The challenges that are faced in low incidence areas there are many common challenges, and then there are those that are specific maybe to particular regions. In this western region of these four states, what we have identified as, as challenges include the maintenance of clinical epidemiologic laboratory and programmatic expertise in the context of very few TB cases. Um, most of the TB control is done at the local level where public health nurses and epidemiologists have competing priorities for a variety of other diseases and not necessarily uh, only infectious diseases for that part as well. Again, in, in this particular area, there are very few resources, comparatively speaking, for TB control specifically. There are um, geographic barriers that need to be overcome, long distances, mountain passes, weather. Um, and these have served as barriers for specimen transport, for example, and for administering directly observed therapy. Because the private sector is, uh, does, tends not to think TB in terms of clinicians, um, they see it so rarely, so TB clinical suspicion is low, which leads to delayed case finding and increased opportunities for transmission during that infectious period when the case is not uh, identified as having TB. Also in this area, we've found that um, there is a need for surge capacity, that is, you know, resources appear to be fine for normal TB case management activities for the few TB cases there are, but if there is an MDR TB case or a particularly complicated case or outbreak, which we are seeing with increased frequency in some of these low incidence areas, um, there is a need to work harder and find other resources for TB when those circumstances occur. And finally, because of all of these factors, Prevention is one of the lower priorities compared to just doing case management and contact investigation activities. So to reiterate the goal of the Task Order 6, um, it is to identify best practice models for regional capacity building in these low incidence areas. The methods that were used 
were to assess the needs of these four states, to respond to those needs by developing and implementing interventions, and then finally to perform formal evaluations of those interventions that would then allow us to determine is this truly a best practice or not. In the needs assessment in the early time of this project, as I said, we're in year four of the project and this, the needs assessment occurred in years one and two when I actually wasn't physically part of the project, but David Berger was leading it uh, with the principal investigators that I mentioned. The first goal was to describe uh, the TB epidemiology in the region and the infrastructure for TB control. And so interviews were held with state health department staff, local health department staff, laboratory directors, um, and some hospital staff. And it was, one of the goals was to identify, you know, the specific challenges in each of the areas of TB control. And here I have listed those areas being the core TB program functions issues around the private sector and uh, building partnerships there, laboratory challenges, and training and education challenges. Again, to further give you background here, what, was, what is the epidemiology in the region in these, in these four states? Well, if you look at the most populous state, Utah, with a population of over 2.5 million, it has the most TB cases out of the four states, with 34 cases which leads to a case rate of 1.3 per 100,000. And this was in the year um, 2006. Similarly, if you look at Wyoming, which has the lowest population in this area, only half a million, there were four cases reported in 2006 for a case rate of 0 0.8. And then for Idaho and Montana, you see the numbers there, 20 and 13, uh, which is a case rate of 1.4 per 100,000. I, another thing I want to point out is that although Wyoming reported four cases this year, there were zero cases reported in 2005. And so in this next slide, uh, what you see are the trends of tuberculosis for each state in the region since 1994, and then the region as a whole, which is the black line. But what I wanted to point out, that what this graph is telling us, is that in any one particular year, the number of cases that are reported in no way predicts what the number of cases may be in the following year. So as, as I said before, Montana experienced no cases in 2005 and then four cases in 2006. Um, similarly, Montana in 2000 experienced about you know, 10 cases and then later it experienced many fewer cases, let's say in 2003, and then in 2004 the number of cases increased yet again. Although the TB case rate is very low in the region and each state of the region, I wanted to point out that there are particular vulnerable populations, and these vulnerable populations in some cases are similar for the types of vulnerable populations that you find in other low incidence areas, and in some cases they're different. I think here that the American Indians may be a, a unique population to this region um, because there are many American Indian reservations, particularly in Montana. And these folks experience uh, almost 20-fold higher rates of tuberculosis compared to um, the U.S.-born non-American Indian population, tenfold. Um, Similarly, the foreign-born experience much higher rates of tuberculosis compared to the U.S.-born non-American Indian population. Another way to uh, look at these disparities uh, for the vulnerable populations is to look at the overall burden of tuberculosis in the years 1994 through 1999, through this five-year period, and compare it, six-year period, and compare it to the later period, six-year period of 2000 to 2005. As you see in the total column, the total burden of TB has decreased during that time frame by about 29%. And there's been a decrease in burden for both the American Indian population and the U.S.-born non-American Indian population during this time frame. However, for the foreign-born group, there was actually an increase uh, in a, by 11% in the burden of tuberculosis. And this actually is going to become more and more true 
through time because the census and demographics trends show us that there are many more foreign-born persons arriving in this particular four-state region and will be arriving um, over the coming decade. Where do the foreign-born cases come from? Well, in reviewing the data between the period of 2003 to 2005, most of the cases came from Mexico, but many came from Somalia. And there were also 10 countries that reported two to seven cases and one case from 18 other countries. What that means is that there are over 30 different languages that would need to be used for cultural competence in doing case management with these cases. And this is actually one of the challenges in this particular region, since there's very few urban centers where there might be um, good access to medical translators. This slide, uh, so moving away from the epidemiology now and talking a little bit about the infrastructure available in these four states, the slide provides a lot of information, and what I'd like to do is just summarize that information. For the most part, TB control activities are done at the local level, so the county level or the uh, health district level in Idaho, for example, has six health districts where counties are combined uh, for their health department activities. There is rarely, uh, for most of these states, there is no access in state to medical or nurse consultants. Um, all of those who do TB control are generalist uh, public health nurses who have these competing priorities of other diseases and prevention activities. Um, and there is one full-time uh, equivalent of a TB dedicated person or fewer, in the case of Idaho, there are two people who spend 0.25% of their time, 25% of their time with dedicated to TB control. The needs that were identified during the needs assessment process of the Task Force 6 project included these. And again, because there isn't uh, in-state um, medical and nursing consulting, clinical consultation was considered very high on the list. Additionally, the need to train um, the public health staff uh, at the local level um, and also provide a guide that would be comprehensive for the field staff to perform TB activities. Again, these are folks who rarely see TB and who um, need to be reminded, what are the way, how do we do TB control? What are the steps I need to take when I find a suspected case? Laboratory services assessment was determined to be a need. The laboratory, public health laboratory directors found that they, in the past, had did not have the resources to determine what are the laboratory practices in my state. Um, and so this was considered a very important need. Uh, and finally, outbreak surveillance and, and surveillance in general. It thought was, help was needed in that area. So to address these needs, Task Force 6 developed and implemented interventions. And the process that was used for the intervention development was uh, an advisory group process where it involved the stakeholders directly, so not just the Francis J. Curry National TB Center staff, but the TB controllers and their designees at the state levels in Idaho, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming, as well as those, uh, some in the local level and laboratorians at the public health department. This is the next two slides are very busy and I really just want to give a brief summary because there were so many areas that we developed interventions for. I'm going to go into more detail for a subset of these interventions. But the area of policy and planning um, was all about developing what do we need to develop, uh, further develop our policy and actually disseminate our policy at the state level to those that actually practice TB control. And the product there is the TB control manual template. For clinical consultation, I'll describe to you a little bit later about how the regional warm line through the Curry Center um, was different for Task Order 6 compared to normal warm line function here at the Curry Center. For laboratory services, um, the interventions included surveying the variety of laboratories that were out there within the region as well as developing trainings to respond to the findings from those surveys. Um, surveillance involved uh, developing plans around the regional use of genotyping data, as well as the, the development of an outbreak response template specific to low incidence areas. Advocacy and collaboration was seen as a major need. I'm not going to talk much more about the um, 
the intended outcome, which is a regional TB elimination plan, except to say that this is something that the states feel is quite important to engage their uh, outside stakeholders, policymakers, legislators, who have control of the purse strings to let them know that TB control is an important activity and that prevention really costs a lot less than uh, responding to outbreaks, for example. And finally, in the area of program evaluation, um, Idaho had developed a case management teleconference model, uh, an interjurisdictional model for uh, communication with all of its health districts uh, at the local level. And um, finally, uh, each of these interventions that I've mentioned uh, are undergoing formal evaluation. So I want to talk specifically about the TB control manual template because I believe that this is a guide that may be useful for other low incidence areas. Um, it will be available in June at the Francis J. Curry National Tuberculosis Center website. Um, what it is, is it translates national guidelines into a how-to field guide. And it is a template, so that means that, that it's customizable, that each state can take this template and insert some of the areas that are very specific for the epidemiologic and infrastructure circumstances in their state. Another real benefit to this is that it can serve to standardize the case management and contact activities um, as well as clinical practice across the state when all of the local folks have this in hand and use this as their guide. For the clinical consultation intervention, the way the warm line currently works at Francis J. Curry National Tuberculosis Center is that we have very talented volunteers um, that rotate on the warm line, and I believe that the rotation schedule is every week. What this means is that those folks in the western region that call the line um, around a case management, you know, questions and contact investigation questions that may occur over many months may get a different person on the line every time that person calls. And so for Task Order 6, we had the funding to actually pay a very, for, you know, not very well, but to at least pay a little bit, um, Charles Daly, Charlie Nolan, and Randall Reeves to be the persons to answer the line specifically for those, those four states when they had a question. And then, um, then the TB controllers in each of those states knew that they could stick with Chuck Daly or Charlie Nolan once their case management activities stuck. As they said, the advantage compared to the usual Operation Warm Line is that it allowed the building of relationships between the TB controllers, other providers that might call Chuck and Charlie and Randall, um, as well as continuity through the case management and contact investigation activities. Under the guidance of the Laboratory Advisory Group, surveys were developed to assess mycobacteriology practices across the four state regions. These surveys identified particular areas of concern around lab safety issues, the turnaround times required for gathering um, the information, and also reporting issues. It was identified that some laboratories did not report positive findings in the lab to the appropriate public health program. In response, laboratory trainings were held within the, the uh, region itself, and at least two of these occurred and it included those both in the public and private sector, as well as some of the large commercial laboratories out there. You know, AROP is uh, one of those major large commercial laboratories that's in Utah. The laboratory advisory group has decided that it wants to be an ongoing network to share problems and solutions. And so although the funding for Task Order 6 will end in March, it's a group that feels like it's very important to stay in touch. Again, the laboratory has many competing activities occurring on and to ma maintain expertise and to keep track of the latest diagnostic tools in TB control, um, it really is necessary to continue this type of communication. In terms of the surveillance approach, here it was thought that a regional approach would be very useful to using genotyping data. And what was required to do that is that data sharing agreements were uh, signed by each of the states. Um, a regional genotyping coordinator role was created, and this role really is for someone, currently we have Neil Abernathy at the Curry Center serving this role, but this role will actually be shifted over to Jerry Carlisle in Utah, who is an epidemiologist there, and Utah has kindly agreed to house this there once Task Order 6 is over. 
What it allows is routine review of genotyping data across the region. Again, for those one FTE or less uh, TB control persons in these low incidence areas, these are folks who are busy with case management activities and responding, and reviewing of genotyping data tends to get a little bit lower on the priority list. So having this separate role for a different person really, I think, will add value to the ability to use genotyping data in a real-time way. This coordinator also provides expertise in consultation. You know, there's so many um, nuances to using genotyping data and determining when you might want to ask for, let's say, IS-6110 RFLP analysis compared to the typical, um, the usual PCR-based uh, Miro and Spalgo type techniques. And also, the regional coordinator serves the role of facilitating communication between the states. So when a cluster is recognized, a genotyping cluster, the regional coordinator will contact the states involved and uh, basically facilitate their interaction to determine, is this truly uh, a potential outbreak or transmission event, or are there, is there something else going on, false positives, communication issues, et cetera. Finally, policies and procedures for reviewing and sharing cluster findings have been written up and are being evaluated as we speak. Some of the findings uh, from the surveillance uh, activities is that seven interstate clusters were identified using the PCR-only techniques, and what we found is that two of those, once we got the RSLP data, were not real clusters. One of them was the, um, the laboratory proficiency strain, H37RV and H37RA, and so those really were not even associated with cases. And there's still some follow-up uh, that is occurring on two of those clusters. One regional outbreak among the homeless was identified by reviewing the genotyping data. And this was an outbreak that included um, not just two states in the region, Montana and Idaho, but also Oregon and Washington, which are outside of the Task Order 6 region, but still within the Western region, and apparently a region where homeless, the same homeless folks travel through. Finally, we identified some quality control issues, and so we found that um, some duplicate reporting was occurring um, of the results uh, for one particular case um, in two different states. And so as a result, Utah developed a, a lab notification system that would prevent this kind of duplicate reporting in the future. Another surveillance intervention was the outbreak response plan template. Um, this was created um, actually um, as a draft. It had been available, it was not quite available to the local public health folks during the outbreak response in Idaho to the homeless uh, outbreak response, but it was assessed in the field as a draft during that response. And what we found is that the goal of that assessment was to determine do we have all of the necessary key elements that would be required um, at both the local and state level to respond to an outbreak. It was determined that a definition for an outbreak, a standardized definition that set up criteria for when an outbreak could be determined was quite important and that roles and responsibilities and lines of communication needed to be outlined within this document. This is another product that is currently available on the Francis J. Curry National TV Center website, and the URL is noted um, on this slide, and please take a look at it if you think you'll, or you're interested. Finally, um, the case management teleconferences in Idaho were uh, evaluated through Task Force 6 and determined to be very useful. What it is is a bi-monthly teleconference with state and local participation where, all, where the local public health nurse will present a case in a standardized format. There are tools for presenting the information. The state TB controller will guide the discussion, and in Idaho, the state TB controller is a medical doctor. And it includes external TB experts, nurses and uh, medical doctors, in this case, Charlie Nolan, um, and the nurses, Brenda Ashkar and Carol Posick of the NTCA. As I said, we evaluated using it, the CDC framework, and it documented the usefulness of this ID, uh, case management by showing that the local public health nurses found that they had increased confidence in doing their job for case management and contact investigation, partially as a result of having this bi-monthly communication with their colleagues in other places and guided by those who have particular and specific TB expertise. 
I don't know if Mark Roboto is on the phone, but as you know, there's also a regional uh, model going, uh, being tested in the New England area, and uh, there is a regional case conference model there um, that I know is also found to be quite useful. Um, and here again on our website, the URL is listed below uh, of where you can find the tools associated with that conference and a little more information. So the lessons that we found are a number of them, and I, I'm just giving a subset right here. But what we found is that building capacity and sustaining improved TB control practices requires dedicated resources and infrastructure. We also found that um, the regional approach was not really applicable in all areas. So early on during Task Order 6, the thought was how can we maybe provide a surge capacity, let's say for doing expanded contact investigations, maybe we could pool our resources across these four states and send, you know, if there happened to be an expanded contact investigation in Utah, what could, could we, you know, pool Montana and Idaho people to help out? And, and really there are regulations and legal barriers to, to that kind of activity. But the kinds of regional approaches we developed um, seem to be relevant and, um, and did not come across these kinds of barriers. A very, very important finding so far is that the elimination of TB requires not only maintenance, as pointed out in the Institute of Medicine report, but really enhancement of TB control. And this is really specific when you look back at the epidemiology of TB in the region, is, is what do we really need to do to address the challenge of TB in the foreign-born? Uh, we need you know, higher resources for cultural competence. We need uh, more creative prevention planning and activities. And again, this requires resources and, and dedication, dedicated activities. As well as for uh, the racial disparity that, that's not discussed too often because uh, this group is uh, small you know, in population, and that is in American Indians. Um, there's actually a lot of work currently being done in the TB Epidemiologic Study Consortium um, around the racial disparity in African Americans, which is such a need and it's incredibly important and I'm glad it's finally being done. But there's another racial disparity for American Indians and this is yet another area that needs to be further addressed. In conclusion, at this point in time in Task Order 6, we have a number of best practice models that are available or will be available on our website um, in the form of the TB manual template, the outbreak response plan template, some of the tools used for regional surveillance, um, some of our findings from the laboratory advisory group and the laboratory services assessment, and the tools for the Idaho case management teleconferences. There are still others that we're evaluating and complete evaluation of all of these models will occur by the end of the year or into uh, March of next year. Um, and these will be posted at the National TV Center website. And finally, this was a huge undertaking. Um, so many folks were involved across the states, um, local folks as well as state folks, as well as all our principal investigators and uh, folks at CDC and nurse consultants across the, the region um, were very involved and we are um, we're thrilled to be working with, with all of these important people. And if I left anyone's name off, it's my fault only, no one else's. Um, please. Um, I thank you for your time. Lisa, thank you very much. But right now we do have time for questions. Hi, um, I was wondering actually if a copy of the needs assessment instrument was also available. I think that would be something that would be really useful for others in low incident states and how applicable it would be for people who maybe weren't looking at a regional model but maybe just something for their program area specifically. Yes, we can share that if you'd like to send me an email. I can try to get that to you. There were a number of tools used um, depending on who was interviewed. And this, this was the stage of the project where I, I was not involved at that point in time. I joined the project a year and a half ago. Um, but I can certainly do the research to identify the tools that were used and send them to you. Good. Any other questions? Uh, a definition of TB outbreak. I'm getting a note in my chat um, from Loretta Gossett. Um, yes, we do have a definition of TB outbreak. I do not have it in front of me at this point in time. Um, again, I can send that to you. But basically, it was created by, again, interacting with the state TB controllers and other interested folks at the local level, as well as our principal investigators, 
looking at what should the criteria be, and there are genotyping criteria and epidemiologic criteria, or program resource criteria. So for example, even if there didn't appear to be an increased number of cases having the same genotype or epidemiologic link, if the TB control program felt that it needed additional resources to do an extended contact investigation because, let's say, there were high levels of TST positivity among contacts, the outbreak definition could be invoked to set into uh, motion the plan for responding to an outbreak in terms of communication and education. Now that we've got sort of a common understanding of the challenges faced by programs um, and some of the effective strategies that can work in these settings in rural areas and low incidence parts of the country, let's look more in depth at how one state, um, New Hampshire, is doing this. I'm going to ask Judy Proctor, who's the uh, TV program coordinator, to talk about how their state is handling that. Ms. Proctor is a registered nurse with long experience in hospice patient care, infection control, staff development, and continuous quality improvement, and tuberculosis management. Judy? Hi, Bill. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me to speak, and um, I just want to preface this by saying that I feel really proud today um, to be asked to speak on behalf of the New Hampshire TB program. Um, and I really represent all of the staff in everything that they say, that I say here today. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a basic overview of the model of care here in New Hampshire, and then talk about the challenges that Lisa just um, discussed in great detail, because challenges in low incidence are, are pretty common. Um, and in New Hampshire, where we're a very small state and a low incidence state, we're reliant upon building partnerships with other people to help us in TB work. In communicating across numerous barriers, we are challenged in how do we maintain the expertise in TB and establishing standards of practice. So once we look at those challenges, I'll look at practical approaches that New Hampshire has taken for each of these challenges and understand that these will be just a very brief snapshot and hopefully will uh, generate some discussion amongst us. One of the biggest dangers in low incidence states is just keeping TB on the radar screen, and I'm sure that all of you in the low incidence states can appreciate that this simple cartoon um, is really representative of a very huge problem for us. So let's look first at the state of New Hampshire. We're a very small state, primarily rural. There are 10 counties in the state. We have 1.3 million population, and as you can see, not too much diversity. So let's look first at the state of New Hampshire. We're a very small state, primarily rural. There are 10 counties in the state. We have 1.3 million population, and as you can see, not too much diversity. For a very low incidence state for tuberculosis, we have a mean of 17 cases annually over the past 15 years with a rate uh, last year of 1.3 per 100,000. Um, our largest risk group here in New Hampshire are the foreign-born population, and in the past five years, 78% of our cases have been in that population. Most of our cases reside in the three southeastern counties um, of the state, which is basically the southeast corner bordered by the state of Maine, to the east and to the south by the state of Massachusetts. We do have 10 counties, but on the map to the, that is displayed on this slide, you will see that these um, are not our counties because we only have seven public health nurses. And so the nurses cover more than one county for their geographic districts. But you can see in the northern part of the state is a very large geographic district, um, but not a lot of TB incidents in that part of the state. And the nurses who cover these geographic districts are public health nurses in communicable disease control, and so TB is not the only thing that they do. We also contract for services with the two largest cities in the state and their city health departments, and those are the cities of Manchester and Nashua, and we consider their staff to be direct um, extensions of our own staff following the same um, case management protocols, et cetera. 
because we're a very low incident state with active cases, LTBI, latent TB infection, is a reportable condition in New Hampshire, and our nurses provide case management for those who fall into um, specific high-risk groups. And those high-risk groups include children under five, people who are immunocompromised, contacts to active cases, recent converters, and those with class B status uh, once active disease, of course, has been ruled out. So the New Hampshire model is a cent we are a centralized state program. There are no county health departments, and I know that sounds like a foreign place to some of you larger incidence areas, um, but there are no county health departments and only two large city health departments, which I've already mentioned. So information flow is actually fairly simple and is bi-directional, meaning that a patient who is reported in one of the district offices as seen on the previous map or in one of the two large cities, the report gets taken in that area and then is relayed to the state level program based in Concord. Um, and the same, obviously, anything reported to the state program gets sent right out directly to the local level, um, to the district or to the city for case management um, activities. So um, nurse case management is the model that we use, and that is entirely home-based because we have no TB clinics in New Hampshire. So visits are made to patients' home or a site of their choice, and patients are rarely um, hospitalized, so most of it is home-based care anyway. Because we have no clinics, our infrastructure doesn't allow for direct management of um, clinical man management of patients. Private providers diagnose and treat all persons with active disease and latent TB infection. Um, the state does not provide medications directly. We don't have a clinic where people can come and pick up their medicines. And so um, medications actually come from a provider's office. The provider writes the prescription. The patient takes it to the pharmacy and fills it. Um, we do have an income eligibility program for people who have no health insurance and are unable to afford the medicines because, of course, we want to make sure that people who need treatment get treatment and that income is not a barrier or insurance is not a barrier to that. Cases of active TB are usually referred to specialists for treatment. Occasionally, a primary care physician will take this on as part of their care, but usually they get referred out to an, infect, um, an infectious disease specialist and sometimes a pulmonologist. So in New Hampshire, we are completely reliant upon um, private providers and other agencies for the initial diagnosis and for prescribing the medications for TB. And so the Think TB message becomes just a critical message that we need to um, always be focusing on and always be putting that message out. It's a huge challenge for us to keep providers thinking TB. The program staff in New Hampshire consists of 2.4 staff who are dedicated to TB. And I mean dedicated in every sense of the word. <laughs> so um, I happen to be the nurse manager, but I also hold responsibilities um, that encompass those of the TB controller, the nurse consultant, the program manager, the surveillance coordinator, the interjurisdictional coordinator, the grant writer, and on and on and on. And I don't think that this is uncommon for low incident states to um, have this kind of a structure. And in fact, as Lisa showed in some of the other states, we look pretty fortunate to have 2.4 um, personnel dedicated to TB. In 2005, and I'll be talking about this a little more detail in a minute, uh, we brought on a part-time education and training coordinator, uh, Lisa Roy. Some of you are know Lisa, and it's been just a great help to have her on board. And then we have a medical secretary position, which is currently vacant. If anyone knows anyone interested in the position, please contact me. We have seven state communicable disease nurses, um, public health nurses, and I've already described that they have the geographic districts. But very important is that they are also res you know, responsible for all the other communicable diseases. So they deal with the meningitis and the hepatitis and the rabies and the arboviral diseases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lots of competing priorities on their schedules every single day. 
We have two communicable disease epidemiologists. Um, one of them, Jody Smith, has recently spent a lot of time um, doing TB work for us. We have two medical consultants, and I'm very fortunate to be able to say that Dr. Jose Montero and Dr. Elizabeth Talbot both have had international TB experience and are available to us on a daily basis. The two city health departments, I've already mentioned uh, the collaborative agreement that we have with them um, in providing nurse case management, and of course, our public health laboratory, which is um, right on site. So basically, because we rely on the private sector to diagnose and treat people with TB, the program really incorporates a philosophy of collaboration within the community. We need private providers and community agencies to diagnose and treat properly, and they need the health department's program as consultants in giving guidance regarding what is proper treatment, what are the current diagnostics available, and how do they interpret the results of something such as a uh, TB direct or MTD um, test. Um, what does genotyping mean? Um, there's a lot of consulting that goes on over these types of activities. Additionally, the public health act activities, of course, include conducting contact investigations, nurse case management through home visits, providing DOT, directly observed therapy, determining when to initiate and release from isolation. So we really are, are a um, model of we need you and you need us between the public-private sector, and it actually is sort of a symbiotic relationship. And um, most of you probably can't read this, but this slide says um, teamwork has such sweet rewards. And we experience this every day um, in this symbiotic relationship where successful patient and program outcomes really rely upon the close communication and collaboration of the public and pri private sector in our TB prevention and control efforts. So let's move on now and talk about some of the common challenges similar to what Lisa had done in the last presentation. So because we are so reliant upon other people, it's critical that we build partnerships in New Hampshire um, with our communities. And um, I'm going to talk in um, great detail about each one of these issues. Communication is always a challenge in, in any area, whether you're low or high incidence, but we'll talk a little bit about our model. Um, the need to maintain expertise um, is a huge challenge, and so we'll talk about training and education and one of, one of the approaches that we have taken here in New Hampshire. And then, as Lisa referred to, the standards of practice, we'll be talking a little bit about one practice, which is um, directly observed therapy. So to be successful as a TB control program, New Hampshire structure begs for the building of partnerships within communities. So um, each communicable disease public health nurse, um, whose districts I showed you in the previous slide, has, is responsible for that geographic district and any case of TB that is reported in one of the towns in that district. So the nurses are keenly aware of how important it is for them to build the personal relationships which come over time, and the key word here is personal. The program relies on these personal bonds to provide high-quality care. So the mission of the nurses becomes how do they become visible within their district or community. And their work involves many outreach activities and over time results in building respect and trust with community partners. One approach that they commonly use is the simple, what I call the meet and greet approach. And all that means is that when they hear of a new provider, a new private provider, or an infection control practitioner in their geographic district, they will usually make a personal visit to introduce themselves and um, carry with them always a packet of information about reportable diseases and the role of public health and how we can help them in um, their job within the community. So it's being visible uh, that becomes very important. So these are some of the people who we have to build partnerships with. And um, we certainly um, could go into lots of detail, but the first one on the list is the New Hampshire Infection Control 
an epidemiology professionals um, organization. And this really is all about the, um, an organization that represents um, infection control people at all of the hospitals in New Hampshire, as well as most of the long-term care facilities, some of the um, private providers' offices, and some other settings. And this group actually is a formal organization that meets every other month in Concord. And all of our nurses um, become members of this organization and go to this meeting so that they can be a face in the, in the, uh, in the membership. And I can't tell you that how many times when I attend these meetings during break time, TB questions come up all the time. And because I'm there, People know my face. People know the nurses from the districts. They come up and ask them questions about any sort of um, TB-related issue, as well as any other infectious disease issue. So what we eventually were able to do was we were able to have one of our nursing staff, one of our public health nurses, was appointed by their board to be a liaison between their board and our office. And this has worked really nicely. And as a result, we have recognized that um, we, we now have time. We have been recognized, and we now have time on their agenda every single time um, that they have a meeting. And so our office um, can, can put on that agenda whatever we feel is the latest and greatest. And TB has talked about certainly every single um, year on one of their agendas. The other partners, um, I won't go into much detail about. How do we build the partnerships, and how do we get known to be in the community? Well, essentially, it's um, finding out who are the infection control practitioners at a particular facility, um, go out and meet them, what practices are knowledgeable and comfortable treating TB patients, who might um, be willing to learn about TB and go out and help them, make a personal visit to their office and try to reach out and give them something. Um, and in return, it, it comes back to us um, many, many fold. So essentially, it's looking at who know, needs to know about TB, who do you need to make think TB, and asking the question of who knows who the public health nurse is in a particular community, and I can tell you, for a fact that if you ask that in most of New Hampshire, most people can name the public health nurse by her actual name. So I'm going to give a very quick example of how this happened, how this relationship helped here in New Hampshire. Um, this is an, an example of a public health nurse in a district who over years developed a relationship with a Carning nursing home and a jail through periodic disease investigations and outreach visits. And one time happened to be meeting the, um, visiting at the local nursing home and found out that there was a new superintendent at the jail. So went over to meet the superintendent and actually got into a discussion about TB testing practices and before leaving left her card with um, the superintendent. So in 2005, uh, we got a call from a county jail about an inmate who might have TB. And this inmate um, happened to be a member of a violent international gang and had been arrested for um, 48 hours earlier after a car accident and had been transported by officers to the hospital, to the jail, the court, and back to the jail and now had an x-ray that was suspicious for TB. And they were planning to transport this person out of state to a federal facility and this call that we got was gr about great panic in the community. And I don't know about any of you on the line, but in New Hampshire, it seems as though correctional facilities are, um, people tend to get very panicky when they hear TB. So by good fortune, the superintendent remembered that public health nurse who a few years earlier had happened to come by and introduce herself. He called her. And it was that relationship that then allowed for some very prompt interventions to take place. So on the very same day, she met with the correctional facility officers, the sheriff's department, and all of these folks to institute, to talk to them about TB and to quickly institute infection control measures, diffuse the um, situation quickly, and TB, of course, was confirmed. 
Let's move on now to the education and training challenge, another huge challenge for us. So some of you may remember that in 2005 there was a new directive from CDC attached to our, um, to our cooperative agreements where we were asked to develop a human resource development plan and target training of staff and providers. And although the good news is that we got additional money to do this that had to be um, targeted to education and training, the bad news was we were left with, well, who's going to do this? That everyone in the program was already wearing uh, too many hats, and how would we um, institute this type of a thing? But we also realized that we were reliant upon outside partners for our delivery of care, and how would we keep them informed and updated? So for us, it was a huge opportunity to grab hold of. And the model that we chose was we hired a part-time uh, focal point person, a TB and education and training coordinator, and that person came on board and um, started immediately with our training needs assessment. And many of you probably know at the program level that there was a tool that was developed by the uh, Regional Training and Medical Consultation Center in New Jersey. And when we reviewed the tool, we felt that it didn't completely meet the needs of our state. Um, and so we worked with the Model Center to, to kind of uh, modify the survey tool to better meet the needs in New Hampshire. And then we also combined it with the also mandated evaluation project that the CDC was asking us to do. So we ended up mailing out a survey to providers in the four highest incidence counties of the state targeting these specialty areas. And um, we got a fairly good response rate, 32% response rate to that survey. And then we have used that survey um, to go ahead and develop TB training um, uh, courses and our HR development plan. So that survey was extremely valuable to us. And then we've gone on to develop listservs for distribution of information and resources to um, to the people in the communities that we need to partner with. We also have started, this year we'll be having our third annual TB conference um, in the state, and we're planning to develop a program brochure. All, all new staff get new employee orientation, and then ongoing training takes place through numerous methods. Um, I'm not actually going to go into too many of them, but I do want to mention that Every other month, all of our staff comes together for a face-to-face -face meeting. And in that meeting, we do case conference in um, work. But a part of the agenda of every one of those meetings is also a training component. Sometimes we do it in-house. Sometimes we invite a, a speaker to come in. And these are samples of the things that we have um, done in, in recent years, in the past year. In terms of the healthcare providers who we are so reliant upon for training, um, the Think TB message is one that we have to um, target all of our training around. Um, medical case consultation is very easily available through our medical consultants, and I think that actually helps with the training. And then we provide some additional workshops and some training with the Dartmouth Medical um, school residents, both who come here to our to our office at the state level, um, and we spend some time with them. And then we also provide some brown bag training presentations during their lunch um, hours, and recently did one on immigrants and TV. The next barrier is communication, and, and what are the barriers to communication? How do we get our messages across this pane of glass, and who's actually inside of this cage? Um, and which way is the com communication flowing? So this pane of glass might be a, um, a telephone. It might be the distance between the central office and the district o or city offices, or it might be a border between states. But we are very fortunate that our small size and the centralized structure facilitates the mechanism of communication. And then we use certainly the um, meetings that we have regularly and then um, the communication with providers, messages, always think TB, um, going to their offices, um, dropping off the packets, greeting them, the phone, the email, the newsletter, and an annual report. 
And then in conclusion are the standards of practice. One that I'd like to highlight that we do here in New Hampshire is universal DOT. And um, that has been a national recommendation. And one of our, um, our administration decided in 1997 that we should institute universal DOT, and we, just, we chose a delivery model of home health agencies that we would pay to provide DOT within their geographic districts. Um, so it was very challenging for us to engage all of the providers, and the most challenging, I will have to tell you, was to engage our own staff in believing that universal DOT was the best way to go. Um, but getting the home health agencies, the providers, and the clients on board all produced challenges and resulted in this becoming now the routine standard of practice. The care, the con we contract with home health agencies to deliver the DOT. We reimburse them at the current Medicaid rate. We train them. Um, we've developed some letters that talk, tell them about TB and um, how to bill our program for the care. And then, of course, we use incentives as needed um, to part for participants in DOT. But the public health nurse, I think the critical piece is, always maintains the case management responsibilities. And this is just a graphic to show you how successful this has been in New Hampshire. So in summary, the New Hampshire strategies that have enhanced TB control efforts have been um, in using a regional approach for a public health nurse in a district office for case management, marketing the, the uh, Think TB message, engaging the community in TB control, maintaining internal and external training efforts, and the ongoing communication that has to take place between the public and private sector. I would be remiss if I did not mention to you the regional efforts that we have undertaken under the direction of Dr. Mark Lobato. Um, and this, these are the six New England states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. And some of the initiatives that have been undertaken have been developing a newenglandtb.org website. I hope you'll go and look it over. Um, we've also looked at um, a genotyping work, have developed a genotyping work group and have begun to share some of the genotyping data across state borders. And then um, we've shared some of the training and education resources and responsibilities between states. And that probably could merit a whole nother um, webinar. So um, this is how you can find us if we've tweaked your interest in some way. And I'd like to acknowledge um, my colleagues here at our staff. And in closing, I'd like to um, certainly thank you for the opportunity to speak, but hope that something that you've heard from us that although we're a very small state and a very low incident state, um, it's my hope that you heard something today that you might benefit from, and thanks for lending me your ear. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, the strategies that you've used really look useful, and I think that many people can get ideas of adapting these and applying them in their own areas. So now that we've seen in depth about how New Hampshire works with its unique structure and resources in coping with a very, very low incidence of tuberculosis, let's see how another state with a different structure and a different set of resources works with the low incidence areas that it has. I'd like to turn to Peter Davidson, the TB program coordinator of the Michigan Department of Community Health, to look at how they're dealing with similar challenges in some of their parts of the state. Peter has a doctorate in cell and molecular biology and has done research on molecular strain typing of MTB with the National Center for Infectious Diseases and the CDC. And he is the uh, coordinator in the state of Michigan. Peter? Hey, thanks, Bill. Um, basically, uh, I just have a couple of points that I want to go through very quickly. Um, first off, I'll provide a quick overview of of Michigan TB in the last several years. And then I'm going to focus on a couple of specific difficulties that we have realized in Michigan and highlight our use of training courses and a TB nurse network to try and overcome those difficulties and then wrap up with a few strategies and ideas that we have to take us into the future. So I think Michigan is kind of interesting in comparison to the western states that we heard about and also New Hampshire in the sense that we have significantly more cases, but our case rate has remained in the low incidence uh, category. 
mainly this is due to the fact that we have a higher population uh, than the other states that we've heard from so far. But a question came up earlier in terms of during a planning stage, well, how is Michigan really qualified as a low incidence state? Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that our TB cases are clustered mostly within a, a fairly tight area in Michigan, most of them in the southeastern portion of the state, which is really the, the only metropolitan area in the state. Um, and then the rest of Michigan is uh, rural and low incidence. Um, you can tell that pretty much in the northern part of the state, we don't have very many cases at all. Just to compare, if you look at a population density plot, you can sort of see that if you compare TB cases, which are the little red dots, and then you compare population density, um, you can sort of see there's a pretty good correlation between our population center and our TB center here in the state of Michigan. Another point that I would like to, to just highlight, and it's something that I think is similar to what we saw in New Hampshire, is that geographically a lot of the state of Michigan has district health departments instead of individual county health departments. Pretty much the entire northern part of the state is managed through what we call district health departments, some of which are fairly large. And then it's really only in the southeastern portion of the state that we have individual truly autonomous county health or local health departments functioning at a county level. And so because of some of these factors, we have highlighted some difficulties in Michigan that are common in some senses to what um, New Hampshire and the western states have seen, particularly the fact that our local health departments are often shorthanded. Um, our staff is spread thin. There's not much dedication on TB specifically. We also have high staff turnover, which I'm sure is common elsewhere. We have a significant difficulty in, focus, in maintaining focus on TB as a specific item, and this is really similar to what Judy Proctor just highlighted with that radar picture. Um, we literally have people at conferences or meetings ask, well, you know, we still have TB, and the answer is yes, just because you haven't seen any for three years, it's still around. We have very few local health departments with staff or funding dedicated specifically to TB education or control or prevention activities. And as, as Judy mentioned, and I think Lisa highlighted this as well, TB responsibilities at a local level are most often integrated in term, with other communicable disease immunizations or other programs. Our local health department staff frequently lack resources, time, and support to educate themselves or update themselves about TB. And another factor that wasn't really highlighted a lot earlier on is that in Michigan, our local health departments operate essentially autonomously. So they do not have standardized forms or procedures from one local health department to the next. Neither is it necessarily standardized with us at the state level. So we do not have a top-down sort of approach the way New Hampshire does. The result of all of this is that depending on how a case is realized, cases can easily become crises. Um, it's not to say that all of our cases are crises here in Michigan, but the, the predisposition to have this occur is definitely in hand. One of the ways that we have gone after to try and deal with, with some of these problems are TB trainings. Our nurse outreach and nurse educating staff initiated trainings in 2002 with the goal of maintaining expertise at the local level by providing educational opportunities to local health departments, focusing on core principles and practices of TB control. We offered four training modules, um, the TST training module, obviously, and then we have also developed a train-the-trainer component, which I'll try to elaborate on a little bit later. We have a case management module, contact investigation module, and a DOT module. And uh, in the past, we've also offered fit testing for N95s, although this activity is sort of uh, phased out a little bit over time. Just the impact of our TB trainings, obviously our skin testing training module has been not only the most widely offered, but also the most highly attended. Concomitantly with that, we have trained trainers, which basically means that in addition to interpreting the skin test, we are also 
and placing skin tests, we were also teaching staff at local health departments how to train others in the same techniques. And this has proved very, very useful because then it's sort of like the metaphor of teaching someone to fish. You know, they can feed themselves indefinitely. So now we're actually trying to enable local health departments to maintain their own training, at least as far as skin testing is concerned. We've had quite a bit of success with that. Contact investigation, case management, and DOT have also been uh, widely offered. DOT is the most recent offering, but it was very well attended in those three sessions. Looking at our nurse network activities, this is really where I want to focus the, the brunt of the presentation. Um, one of the questions that Michigan has encountered in terms of focusing on a nurse network, say, why focus on nurses? I think that Judy highlighted this in some of her comments, um, and I just summarized it by making the statement that nurses are the basis for quality patient care. In Michigan, more than 85% of all public and private health care is directly administered through nurses, and nurses are trained to manage a patient's care during both major and subtle health issues. Our nurses assess, monitor, and diagnose, in some cases, diagnose patient status, um, are involved in recommending and delivering medicines, provide and document case management activities, and they are integral to quality patient care in Michigan. So our nurse network was formed uh, several years ago with the goal of many goals, but mainly providing a venue for communication and information updates uh, to provide update and educational activities regarding state and national guidelines, a forum for discussion, networking, linking new TB nurses with more seasoned nurses who can sort of provide a mentor relationship, and also trying to increase the communication between our state TB control staff and the local health department staff to figure out what needs are on both sides and how best to address those needs. Um, also to increase understanding and use of our state TB laboratory by local health departments. And I should really point out that our state laboratory, and particularly the TB laboratory, is, is very, very excellent. Um, we are blessed by having an extremely competent and timely lab. They turn samples around very quickly. They report very, very well. So one of the activities, one of the burdens that our program thankfully does not have to deal with very often is confusion or um, error in terms of laboratory reporting. In terms of a brief history of our nurse network, our network originated in March of 05 with uh, only five nurses and one supervisor. It very rapidly progressed to 12 counties in southeastern Michigan, and now we are uh, encompassing 14 counties in uh, central and lower Michigan. And Bill Bauer asked me to highlight on a map where some of these uh, counties are. So I'm just going to try and highlight counties very quickly. Um, basically, if you take a line that goes like this, we have most of the counties in this area. We also have counties uh, throughout the western and middle sections of the lower peninsula. One of the outstanding areas that we're looking to expand into is to represent Michigan's uh, upper peninsula, which is up here and is actually geographically separated from us by a mile and a half of very cold water. So we're looking to expand into the upper peninsula with our nurse network and try to figure out a way to build some inroads up there. But I think our nurse network has expanded incredibly well and has been received very, very positively by local health departments. Looking at some of the outputs from our nurse network, we hold quarterly discussions, sort of like a round table, part of which focuses on TB case management. People bring cases, they share them, talk about difficulties or successes that could be applied more generally in, uh, in different jurisdictions. Health departments share their strengths and their failures. Um, TB trainings have been incorporated into the curricula of a handful of academic partners, and this is due to outreach and educational activities occurring 
in parallel to the nurse network by our nurse educators and nurse outreach workers. We have uh, two community colleges in central and lower Michigan um, and three uh, state-sponsored universities, two of which are Michigan State and University of Michigan, the largest universities in the state. Both of these are now collaborating with us in terms of offering, offering training um, trainings that, that we've developed and then provide to them. We have other advocacy partners within the Michigan Department of Community Health, but outside of Bureau of Epidemiology, which is where we are centered. Our D State Department of Community Health, the Immunizations Branch, collaborate with us in exhibitions and also in terms of featuring TV materials in their immunizations toolkits, which are distributed throughout the state to local health departments. And the State Department uh, Office of Drug Control Policy now has staff at their substance abuse centers that have been trained in um, interpreting skin tests, and that training occurred by our nurse educators visiting them and passing on the training. Some of the things we're looking at in the future, um, we are looking at developing a TB toolkit specifically, which will serve as a resource for healthcare workers. The view for this, or our vision for this, is it will be a concise and step-by-step -step guide for TB case management from initial determination of a case all the way to completion of therapy and closure of the case. And also our goal would be that this would also be a mechanism to try and start standardizing some of the forms that, that we all use, um, which would make everyone's life a lot easier. We're also beginning to implement program, program evaluations of our TST courses. Um, right now we're conducting this by doing on-site observations of instructors who Remember I said to train the trainers, so we're now going back and local health department staff whom we have trained to be trainers themselves, our nurse educators are now going out and observing courses that these people teach to make sure that they're really teaching what we want them to teach, they're teaching it in the way that we want them to teach it, and that their messages are maintaining consistency with what we want to have from the state program. Uh, the feedback from these observations has been very positive which is nice to hear because sometimes we have a little bit of animosity at the local level towards a view of imposition from the state, but in this context that has not occurred. It's been very positive. I just want to wrap up quickly and acknowledge the, the key contributors. I'm, in this presentation, I'm just the mouthpiece. The people who have actually done the work are Gail Dinkins and Julia McCollum, our nurse educators, uh, both of them extremely skilled and competent. Um, Andrew Connect is our uh, state epidemiologist and Tracina Cropper is our CDC public health advisor assigned to the TB control program. That is the whirlwind tour of trainings in TB nurse network in Michigan. Okay, the lines are open. Please, if you have any questions of Peter or actually of any of the uh, panelists, please ask them now because we're coming close to the end of the seminar. The toolkit in Michigan? Yes. What is the title of that? Is well, that contact <laughs> investigation for tuberculosis? Is that what you're talking about? The question was focusing on, on whether I think contact investigation is a part of the toolkit that we're trying to develop. And the answer is yes, it will be. But currently we offer trainings um, which, and I, I didn't really elaborate on this very well, but our trainings currently are contact time between our nurse educator or other staff from the state office and local health department staff. And these trainings either occur at local health departments, in which case we go out and meet people on site, or uh, we have also organized some trainings um, here in Lansing for people who are located geographically close. But the, the four modules that we currently offer training on are the TST testing, case management, contact investigation, and DOT. All of these modules that we currently offer trainings on will be included in the toolkit that we are developing. However, they will probably be condensed into the format of a like a thumb tab uh, guide, so you can just you know pull out a binder or pull out a, 
a very concise manual and say, if I have a question on a contact investigation, you flip to that tab, open it, and there's, you know, maybe three to five pages of just very condensed, bulleted information to say, this is what you need to go after. Here's how you would go about it. I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. Yes, thank you. And when will that toolkit be available? Um, as soon as we can all reach consensus on what material should go into it. I mean, it's, it's in development right now. That's actually one of the ongoing activities of our nurse network is that every meeting we have, every quarter when we have a meeting, we'll all brainstorm for about half an hour and decide on new material to put into the toolkit, what the format should be, um, it, perhaps hopefully by the end of the year. <laughs> Okay, and then you'll you'll notify nurses like through CD conference or email yes. or something like that. Okay. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank, thank you. Hi, I actually had a question specifically for Judy, and this is regarding with all the new guidelines that had come out at the end of 2005. I know that you had mentioned in your presentation sort of developing relationships with people in correctional facilities and your ICPs and people like that. But I was wondering how you sort of got the word out about new guidelines and then with so few staff, how you were able to incorporate some of those things into your local TB guidelines. That's a good question. It, it kind of makes me remember a funny story, and that was those guidelines came out in infection control guidelines and, and numerous others came out in December of 2005. And I got a phone call the first week of January of 2006 from the Infection Control Practitioners Group who said, at our January meeting next week, would you be willing to present the new infection control guidelines? <laughs> Which um, I laughed about <laughs> and then explained that that would just be impossible because I had to read them and digest them first and figure out how we would implement them here in New Hampshire. So um, ultimately, I did present them at that group, and that's a great uh, audience to disseminate material through because that group then brings it back to the infection control committees at their um, respective facilities. So it came back then to the hospitals, et cetera. So that's a group that we disseminate information readily. Then the nurses themselves actually sometimes hand carry new guidelines and will hand it to appropriate people within their communities. We've had some large presentations. I did a presentation for what's called the Healthcare Symposium, which had, I think, about 1,200 nurses attending um, and spoke about TB and the new infection control guidelines, and that was in, I think, August of 06. So there, you know, that's basically how we go about disseminating information. Global TB Institute offers medical consultations on the information line at 1-800-4-TB-DOC. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, this concludes the presentation, and we hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to your feedback. Thanks very much.